Daniel Morehouse was the sixth president of Drake University. And he was the first at that particular point to first be a student at the university and then evolved to eventually become president. We know he was so interested in astronomy. He uh, had the uh, observatory built, but that was actually just one of his accomplishments. Uh, in 1922, he became president of the university and he that he held that position until he died in 1941. Uh, but the other thing was that he was extreme. He actually ran Drake very successfully through uh, through the Depression times, and uh, he was instrumental in raising funds not only for Drake Stadium, but also the Fieldhouse and the original Coles Library. We know his interest in astronomy was so extreme, I guess you can, his, his, I should say his enthusiasm was so extreme that as a college doing night games, he would, during halftime, he would actually douse the lights and then use a spotlight out of the drama department to, uh, I, I, I don't think you can illuminate the stars from here, but certainly point out where various constellations were. This particular picture was actually taken less than a year before Dr. Morehouse passed away. Now, where did he come from? Where did this, this unbelievably enthusiastic uh, astronomer come from? Well, he was born in a log cabin on February 22nd, 1876. And as you know, anyone who was born in a log cabin uh, is at least five miles from school, both ways uphill. Well, actually, uh, uh, Dr. Morehouse was an enthusiastic learner. He loved knowledge and he loved the, the challenge uh, that he gave to himself to learn more and more. At that particular time, uh, he actually received what's been called a classical education, which also include learning Greek and Latin. So he became proficient almost immediately in three languages. Now he didn't have this particular point, he didn't have a particular interest in any one, in one, one subject, but he demonstrated a very good knowledge of virtually all uh, subject matter. And as a result, he was picked to be the local school teacher and taught in one one room classrooms for a good number of years uh, out of high school and decided uh, when he was in his late teens that he needed more education and decided to go to college. The first college he went to was Northwestern uh, Christian College, which was in Excelsior, Minnesota. And he was he actually went there for oh, several years. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't stay there because the school uh, actually uh, received a good deal of damage from a fire. He wanted to continue his education and decided, well, where's the next place he wanted to go? Uh, well, he heard about this college that opened up about a dozen years ago down in Des Moines, and he decided he was going to go there. So in 1897, uh, Daniel Morehouse applied to and was accepted by Drake University to, uh, to be matriculated into their uh, studies program uh, the fall of 1897. 
And he figured, well, Des Moines is a growing city. He's sure he can get a job to supplement uh, whatever income he needed in order to pay the $300 a year tuition. Now, board was, will you add to that in order to get board? So he came to Drake University in 1897, and immediately he found that it was, a, it was everything he thought it would be. Uh, being a, uh, a product of the prairie, uh, he, he enjoyed the rigor of learning and he also enjoyed the rigor of sports. He was uh, very much involved in the, uh, in the football team, the football seasons. And uh, he actually uh, started, uh, was one of the uh, uh, first people to uh, get into the science building where it boasted a brand new telescope. This was in 1897. The telescope was a yet another donation made to the university by Francis Marion Drake, the founder of the university. And they built a special wing just for that telescope. And you can see it there uh, with the dome on top. And he had some interest in that, uh, but the interest really blossomed when his roommate gave him a challenge. The challenge was a, a person who lived off campus had a astronomy book that needed to be translated. And uh, Morehouse, uh, being proficient in several languages, decided to take on that challenge. He translated the book, uh, gave the person the translation, and kept the book for himself. So, uh, and what he found was the fact that the, the science of astronomy, in fact, science in, in general, absolutely floored him. He wanted to know more and more about science. So he actually went out and found every book he can find on science. Well, maybe not every book on science. Anyway, but he, he read everything that was available about science. And what this lecture is about is what did he actually find in these books in the year 1897, 1897 to 1900? What was the state of astronomy at that particular point in time? And it gives us a really good understanding of how astronomy has progressed uh, since that time. For one thing, at the time that uh, Morehouse uh, discovered astronomy, Mars was being investigated by an astronomer by the name of Vasif Hall. And Dr. Hall found two moons going around Mars. Now, he wasn't the first. He knew they had to be there. So he actually used, at that particular point, the largest scope that was available, and he found these two moons. What's really spooky about this whole thing is the fact that an English author by the name, <coughs> by the name of uh, Jonathan Swift, actually wrote about Mars more than a hundred years earlier than this. And he talked about the discovery of these two moons. And that was in the book, Gulliver's Travels. 
So even though Gulliver's Travels was written about 140 years before the discovery of the two moons going around Mars, Gulliver's Travels des describes very accurately these two moons, actually 140 years before they were actually discovered. What else did uh, what else did Morehouse discover? Well, we all know that when you are looking at light, uh, that light has to, well, we know it now as photons coming to us. But at the time that Morehouse was learning about uh, astronomy and science, it was discovered that light works as a wave. And all waves need some type of medium to travel through. So there was a, at, at around the time that Morehouse came to uh, Des Moines, there was an experiment that was just completed. Uh, most of the, uh, of the, uh, um, Results of that experiment were still being written up. And what it was, it was trying to prove that the light waves that came from other stars actually traveled through some type of medium in order to get to Earth. Now we know that air needs a medium to travel through. I mean, I should say sound needs a medium to travel through. So we know that these waves will get to us. But when you're looking at moving air, you can see how the air is compressed and then expands as this shock wave actually travels to us. So there has to be some type of a medium for this energy to travel through. And you can see here that if you have a solid, the energy is transferred better than a gas or a liquid. So an experiment was set up in order to discover what this luminiferous ether was doing to the light that was coming to the Earth from other stars, other galaxies, or certainly from way out in space. And this is known as the michelson morley experiment. Now, I have a simplified view of this, but it's basically the same thing. The idea is that they wanted to send two light beams, and they wanted to send them in, in perpendicular uh, arrangements so that one of them would be somehow affected by the flow of this luminescent uh, ether. So they built something called an interferometer. And basically what an interferometer does, it sends a beam of light where it's split up by a mirror, travels a length, and since they're going in, in perpendicular directions, one of those is going to be affected. So it worked like this. And when they come together, if they hit at the same time, then there is nothing there to affect the light. But if one of those beams it actually travels through the ether and that ether is moving, that beam of light will have slowed down. So we'll go ahead and we'll add ether to this arrangement. And then what they were looking for was something like this. And as you can see, the yellow actually slowed down a little bit so that it arrived to the detector a little bit after 
the red beam. That's what they were looking for. And then uh, they would be able to determine how, how fast the ether was moving, how dense the ether was moving, and then be able to build uh, some type of an arrangement so that they could compensate for this. What did they actually find? What they actually found was the fact that there was no ether. Light actually traveled in both directions at exactly the same speed. This really surprised them. They felt for sure that they had a way of measuring how much the ether, the uh, luminescent ether, would have slowed the progression of light. Now, uh, this was in uh, about uh, 1890, and uh, actually uh, we're still about uh, 15 years uh, on the wrong side of Einstein. Uh, and then he explains it at that particular point with general relativity, but we're not there yet. So this was one of the things that uh, Morehouse was involved with uh, learning about when he uh, started learning about astronomy and, and uh, physics. The other thing was the spectrum. Now, more work was done on the spectrum and light during this time than virtually anything else. One of the things that was fresh in everyone's mind was something called the Kirchhoff laws. And Kirchhoff was a physicist uh, who decided that he was going to uh, take a look at what makes a spectrum. They were just beginning to learn about spectrums. They found, uh, uh, Fraunhofer actually made an instrument that would make a spectrum. Uh, they didn't quite know what it meant at this particular point. They certainly didn't know what made the spectrum. They just knew that there were spectrums out there and the fact that different elements seem to have different spectrums. So Kirchhoff's laws basically say that if you have a light, you shine it through a prism and you get a continuous spectrum. If you have a cool gas and you illuminate it, you will have something called an absorption spectrum. Meanwhile, if you take a gas, make it hot, and shine that through a prism, you will have an emission sp spectrum. And this was a pretty big discovery because what they found was the fact that certain elements had, you know, if they used a cool gas or a hot gas, it had the same spectrum. If it was a cool glass, uh, gas, it was an absorption spectrum. If they had a hot gas, it was an emission spectrum. And this was one of the things that, again, Morehouse was learning about when he learned more and more about uh, light and spectrums. Uh, later on, they discovered that different elements actually had different colors and that different elements had different spectrums. And the more complex the element, the more complex the spectrum. Then around oh, about the middle of the 1800s, a scientist by the name of Doppler found 
that if you stand in front of a train, as the train is coming toward you, the pitch of the whistle goes higher. After you're hit by the train, you find that the whistle, these, the uh, pitch of the whistle actually goes down. Unfortunately, Doppler only did this once. No, I'm, I'm sorry, that's all wrong. Uh, Doppler actually came up with the, uh, uh, the math that's involved to actually do this. And what he found was the fact that if something, if a, an object is standing still and it is emitting energy, or in this case, sound waves, uh, an observer will notice this have actually get the same pitch of sound waves. But if that source of that pit of that sound is coming to you, coming toward you, the pitch will actually be higher until the source moves past you. And as you can see, as the source moves toward the first man, uh, the pitch goes to 120 hertz, and then after it passes, it drops down to 780 hertz. What made this really interesting was the fact that the, the, the new research that was done uh, just before uh, Morehouse came to Drake started equating this to light. And they found that when something was moving toward the Earth, everything would be blue shifted. The spectrum would be pushed toward the blue side. After the source left, moved away, it would actually be pulled toward the red side. So this, this Doppler shift also worked with light. And in this particular book, as you can see, the copyright date is 1903. They talk about, in, in that book, they talk about the possibility of using the Doppler shift of light to determine the velocity of either stars coming toward you or stars moving away from you. At this particular point in time, telescopes were not quite fine enough to be able to pick it out. But they talk about the possibility of actually determining star velocities by using Doppler shift. Uh, we can move ahead about, oh, something along the lines of about 20 years when Edwin Hubble used this very same theory to show that galaxies were moving away from each other. So Dr. Morehouse, or at this point, Daniel Morehouse, was on the cutting edge of this particular uh, piece of scientific work. Now, one of the things that really helped a lot was the, uh, was the camera. And scientists, or actually astronomers, took pictures of the sky, especially around the Milky Way. They knew the Milky Way was some type of a gathering of stars. They thought it might have been the only gathering of stars in our sky. They weren't quite sure what it actually looked like. And they used something called a telescope to try to figure that out. Now, a telescope gives you a very fleeting image. What would help more than a telescope? Well, how about a camera? Put a camera on the end of the telescope and you'll find that suddenly this telescope becomes a way of archiving your 
uh, your observations, and you can begin to compare things one to another. When Morehouse uh, was still teaching up in Excelsior uh, or Mankato, uh, a, uh, a photographer by the name of Henry Draper, this is in the year 1880, took a picture of the Orion Nebula and it came out with this is what it looked like. Not too bad, I think. Uh, most amateurs would say, I can do an awful lot better than that. And actually, uh, three years later, another amateur took a picture of this same area, and we can discover how much the science or the art of photography had increased. So at this particular point, photography became the, you know, the buzzword for learning about astronomy. Astronomers, or actually more like amateurs, Henry Draper was actually a dentist uh, who discovered astronomy and discovered that uh, he can use all the proceeds from his dentistry uh, to take absolutely amazing pictures of stars and that later on when he really got into it he actually took pictures of the spectra but before that they took pictures of the milky way they tried to determine what the shape of our galaxy is and what they found was the fact that about 200 years no, about 115 years earlier, a uh, actually a music teacher by the name of William Herschel drew this map of our galaxy. He determined that the sun was somewhere in the middle of that mess. And the fact that really this doesn't give a real accurate a picture of our galaxy. Uh, he actually thought that our galaxy was really resembled a grindstone and that the our sun was somewhere in the middle of this grindstone. Somewhere around the early 1800s, a, an astronomer that by the name of Charles Messier uh, was looking for comets. And he would discover lots of things, lots of little fuzzy objects up there. And in order, then he'd spend months watching them only to discover that they didn't move, they weren't comets. So in total frustration, he made a catalog of 110 objects that you should not a mistake for a comet. And you can see that some of them, you know, there's you know, there's the Orion Nebula down in the lower right. But if you look on the upside in the middle, there's something that's a little bit familiar about that. Uh, that is the Andromeda, or at the time was called the Andromeda Nebula. Now they had no idea that it was actually a galaxy at that point. And in, uh, in the uh, early 1900s, it was just considered to be a nebula. Um, we're still 20 years away from any of the observations that Hubble did. But the, and in fact, if you take a look at some of the pictures that were drawn of that particular object, they're terrible. I mean, really. The first photograph taken of the Orion Nebula was in 1888, and this is it. Now, I, you know, 
2020 hindsight tells me that's a little bit more than a nebula, but then again, I have uh, 70 years of astronomy behind me. Uh, anyway, but the it was photography that really eliminated the uh, the ability to draw these objects. And really the most amazing photographer of all these, I just, I just talked about him, was Henry Draper. As you can see, uh, Dr. Draper died in 1882, but his work, believe it or not, today is still being used. He donated to Harvard University, or actually at the time it was Harvard College, more than a hundred thousand plates of spectrums of star spectrums and what he discovered is the fact that they don't have to be in color because the the spectral lines are all you know where they are their their location is what's important so you don't have to see red or blue or green. The lines that put the placement of the lines is what's important. So they found that the stars gave off their own spectrums. And some of these spectrums, they determined, uh, did give what elements are on there. Some of the other uh, things they found with these spectrums was the fact that it also gave approximate temperatures. Of course, there's a lot of physics that came in behind this. There was, a, and I'll talk about this in a minute, uh, all sorts of physical laws that determined energy and temperature. But when he donated all these to Harvard University or Harvard College, he had two very uh, active groups looking after it. One of them was the Harvard Computers. Now, these are similar to the NASA computers, only it's uh, several generations before. What these women did was simply do a lot of the grunt work that had to be done. And the person behind is uh, William Pickering. And uh, Dr. Pickering was a man who was very advanced uh, as far as his belief in that women would play a monumental part of the research of astronomy. One of the first people to get their, shall we say, get their hands on the plates was a college graduate, Wilhelmina Stevens. And she actually studied these plates and found that they can be classified by the amount of hydrogen that she saw in these spectrums. What's interesting is, the, is how she actually got the job to study the, the actual plates that uh, Draper uh, that, that Draper gave to the university. Uh, he, she was actually hired as a uh, as literally a nanny to Pickering in order to do uh, for his children. And Pickering was so angry with his graduate students over the fact that they couldn't seem to do simple math that he yelled at him saying his nanny could do better. Well, as it turned out, she could. And she basically put them all to shame. The the classification by spectrum uh, became the, uh, the way to actually classify stars. 
they found that different stars or different temperature stars actually gave different results. Uh, stars that were hot gave thin lines. The cooler stars had thicker lines. Uh, they found stars that seemed to have double lines, and those were stars that had other stars going around it. And uh, Stevens was able to determine the various types of stars that the spectrums showed. The next person to have access to these plates was Annie Jump Cannon. And Annie Cannon uh, actually had a disability that helped her tremendously. She was deaf. Well, that, that definitely focused her attention on these, uh, on these spectra. And she basically tweaked the classification of stars to what we actually use today. And uh, she actually classified the stars by temperature. When you realize the amount of work that she did, it is absolutely mind boggling. She worked at the at Harvard University or Harvard College for 45 years. And in that time, she classified more than 300,000 stars. Amazing, amazing work. She is the one who gave us the classification of stars. Oh, be a fine girl, kiss me right now, smack, which shows up in her, uh, this is actually a classification diagram. And as you can see, as you go up from K up to zero, you can see the lines tend to disappear. That's because the heat the, the tremendous heat from the stars actually uh, ionizes more and more of the gas. So if you want to know what the temperatures are, uh, they actually get higher the further up in the graph you go. So this was a tremendous amount of work in determining how stars are classified. Now, the other, some other mysteries that actually were part of Morehouse's learning process was this one. They had no idea how the sun worked. They had no idea how it produced the energy. They knew that if it was a lump of coal, uh, 800,000 miles in diameter, it would maybe give off heat for about 6,000 years. So it had to be something different. And what it was just basically boggled their imagination until they started thinking about, well, if we took some gas, if we, well, if we took some gas, and we took its temperature as it condensed, we would find that temperature to go up. So it makes sense that the sun, in order to give off this heat, has to be contracting. So they determined that the sun was giving off the heat of contraction and it was getting smaller and smaller all the time. And they figured that the life of the sun would be about 200 million years. And they felt pretty good about that. I mean, you know, 200 million years is a pretty good time. 
So, uh, so Morehouse's time on campus, uh, he actually spent more and more time in the observatory in spite of the fact that it was on the end of the trolley line, which rumbled like crazy every time a trolley passed. He couldn't, he actually had to wait in between the trolley times in order to take pictures on this. So he knew that uh, he wanted to learn more about astronomy and physics. And being a full-time student there, he, uh, this is, a, believe it or not, from what I understand, this is an actual picture of Morehouse at the uh, chemistry lab table. And he graduated from Drake in 1900 with a BS degree. He went on to the University of Chicago, where he graduated from there with a BS degree in 1902. He came back to Drake, at, and at the same time he graduated from the University of Chicago, he also graduated from Drake with his master's degree in, in astronomy. And at this point, Drake actually hired him as an instructor. But Morehouse wasn't satisfied. There was an awful lot more for him to learn. One of the things that was, was out there was the fact that Mercury, the closest planet to the sun, did not follow Kepler's laws of planetary motion. If you watch the orbit of Mercury, over time, it'll actually seem to precess. The only reason for this to happen in their minds was the fact that there had to be a moon in between Mercury and the sun. And it was actually, quote, discovered not really, but they thought it was there. They even figured out how far away it was. So there had to be Vulcan, which had, uh, which had to be orbiting uh, the sun. Now, again, a lot of this stuff was all cleared up uh, shortly, actually about about seven or eight years after all this with uh, Einstein's miracle year where he talks about the photoelectric effect, uh, the theory of relativity and the conservation or actually the, uh, uh, the, the laws of, uh, of energy. But Morehouse knew he had to continue his studies. He knew that he had to get his doctorate. And at the time that he figured this, they were looking at Jupiter. Jupiter, they had just discovered uh, some moons around Jupiter. For the longest time, Jupiter only had four moons, the Galilean moons. Then in 1892, they discovered number five. Then in 1904, they discovered number six. And at this point, Morehouse must have thought, the next moon that they find around Jupiter is mine. And in 1905, they discovered number seven. And Morehouse jumped on it. He immediately sent word, actually sent a proposal to the University of California. Why to the University of California? 
because they have a brand new telescope there. They had Lick Observatory. And he decided he was going to do his work at Lick Observatory. So he was going to take uh, number seven and he was going to fill in that chart. Um, they, you know, he even he even took a picture of it from, uh, and this was actually from Lick Observatory. So in 1905, he gave a proposal that he was going to discover all the astrometrics of this, the seventh moon of Jupiter. And then he applied to the University of California to get time on their big telescope, which was rejected. There wasn't any time available. There was a lot of people who wanted to use it and it just wasn't available to him. At about the same time that Daniel Morehouse was being stymied in his research, Henrietta Swan Leavitt, on the other side of the country, had made a major discovery. This discovery would actually expand the universe. He, she discovered something known as Cepheid variables. What the heck is a Cepheid variable? It's actually a star that varies in brightness exactly the same way every time. And the amount of time it takes to vary is proportional to how bright it becomes. If you can find a Cepheid variable where you know what the distance is, you'll be able to use a Cepheid variable anywhere you can spot one to determine distance. And at the time, no one knew how profound that discovery was going to be. So by using the variability of these stars and by using something called uh, the, uh, the candle of a particular brightness, you would be able to tell how far away stars were. Well, getting back to Morehouse, he wasn't totally uh, stymied by this. He still had friends at the University of Chicago. So he decided to apply there for time with their new telescope, the 40 inch telescope at Yerkes uh, uh, in Wisconsin. And he got time for that. It was still uh, pretty new, so he was able to get in right that. And what's the first thing he does? He discovers a comet. And as soon as he discovered that comet, he flew. Actually, no, he didn't fly. He actually drove, actually took the train. He took the train from Williams Bay, Wisconsin, down to Des Moines, Iowa. It took the better part of about a day and a half. Went into the observatory, that rickety observatory that was being uh, vibrated by the trolley and took hundreds of pictures of that comet. He became known, well, he was in 1908, he was the Comet Man. He uh, determined, actually he helped plot the orbit of that comet, which really wasn't an orbit. It was actually an hyperbole, uh, which meant that it was a, uh, it made one pass near the earth and that was all, that's all it saw. 
But one of the things his pictures did inspire was the fact that in looking at the pictures of how the comet changed, this inspired uh, some scientists to look at the solar wind as a real as a real thing. So his pictures actually inspired the discovery of the solar wind. But of course, uh, Dr. Morehouse at this particular point, or actually he wasn't a doctor yet, he was still Professor Morehouse, uh, he gave lectures about Halley's Comet. Uh, as you can see, it was 15 cents a pop. That translates to about four and a quarter right now. So he was able to uh, do his research. At this particular point in time, with the research that, has, that had been done, the, especially on spectrums and stuff like that, the, the advancement of astronomy, what it needed was somebody to put all the loose ends together. And there were two men who didn't know each other who actually did that. And those two men were Hertzsprung and Russell. And in 19, about 1911, which was about this time, they actually put together a chart that was based upon all the loose ends that spectrums gave. And this was another major, very major discovery. So by simply looking at the spectrum of a star, you can determine all of this. And I can't even imagine what Daniel Morehouse felt when he saw the first write-up of the original Hertzsprung and Russell diagram, where they actually classified all of the stars you see in the sky. This must have just absolutely had him shaking in his boots because this actually tied together so many loose ends that, that Morehouse saw coming down the road. Well, to keep on moving here, uh, the doc, um, I should as I say, Professor Morehouse defended his thesis in 1914 and was awarded his PhD from the University of California. He was able to fill in the, uh, the blank so that he was able to move forward from that. And from here, right now the year is about 18, uh, 1815, 1816, he decided he was going to come back and stay in Des Moines. He came back and found his favorite roosting place, Waveland Golf Course. And golf was his best form of relaxation since he was getting a little bit too old for football. By this time, uh, he had a wife and two children and decided that maybe Waveland Golf Course could be a place where he can do more work. He always liked the high point on in Waveland, and there was a windmill on top of that. And he kept on pointing that out to friends and saying, that's the perfect place for an observatory.
he proposed the observatory in 1919, helped raise the funds for it with the city, and in 1920 broke ground. The dedication was November 5th, 1921. And we've been, uh, in 1922, he was made president of the university and he was president of Drake University until his death in 1941. Next week, what we're going to be doing is taking a look at the big eyes, the quest to build the perfect telescope in an imperfect environment.